see our college students again. And I, I'm sure as you guys disperse, you get to bless lots of, of churches, but it's always a good blessing uh, to see you again. And, and Gabby and the rest, thank you for leading us in worship this morning. Um, did anyone have a successful time uh, this season not going to a single store for Christmas? Okay, a few of you uh, crushed the post office and had Amazon del- deliver everything. Um, I had to go out, I think it was one time, and it actually might have been shortly after Christmas. It wasn't a Christmas-oriented um, trip, but it, it was in the season. Uh, we had to find some skiing gear for uh, Madeline. Uh, she outgrew some snow pants. And so we had a real simple mission. We're going to go down to Kittery to the outlets to see if we could find a deal. Um, and so she and I took off one afternoon. And we stopped in one store and uh, couldn't get any help anywhere. Um, and we couldn't find what we needed, couldn't find an employee so we went to a second store, and uh, the employee there was just uh, not helpful at all. Not only not helpful, but not helpful and rude. And so it took us about five minutes, and I'm a pretty patient consumer. I, I don't, I'm not a needy guy when I'm out there. But after about five minutes, I looked at Madeline and said, all right, we're all set, thank you, and we left. And so we were heading to a third store, and she and I had the conversation. Uh, and it, it went something like this. If you had to choose, would you choose to have someone who was competent and not kind? Or would you choose to have someone who was kind but not competent? Have you ever had that conversation? I am, I realized after that, I told Madeline, I am 100% in Give me competent. I don't care if they're a jerk. I don't care if they're not kind. Just help me get it done. Uh, I feel the same way about my doctor, to be honest with you. I don't need him to be really nice to me. I just need him to be really competent as he's moving through. I I say that because I tend to be a pretty linear kind of guy. Uh, Every so often some creativity drops in from some foreign spot. But for the most part, I'm pretty linear as I think and as I live and as I move. Um, certainly my preaching, uh, if you're part of FCCB, uh, you know so much of our life is moving through a book of the Bible and trying to teach something about the greatness of God and how good He is and forgiveness found in Christ. And we do it fairly systematically. If you're a note taker, you can probably take notes um, off most sermons. Today is an exception, all right? So I say all that to say, today might be a bit more random for you. It's the beginning of a new year. Um, It's a time for reflection, pondering. And so this week, I literally started jotting down some of my thoughts about us, about FCCB, about the year to come, about God's work among us. So if you're a linear thinker like me, be patient. Next week is coming soon. If you're uh, not a linear thinker, you're probably just going to love the fact that you don't need to take notes and you can just kind of listen to some thoughts. So uh, let me drop us into Numbers chapter 13, if you can find your way there. Numbers is part of the first five books of the Bible. And this is, essentially, Numbers is the report of God's people as they're moving through the desert, getting closer to the promised land. Numbers chapter 13. I think what we'll do is start in verse 17. So God's people are right on the cusp. I mean, they're right on the verge of exploring the territory that God had promised them. It's been a lot of years that they've been wandering around the desert. So here we go. Verse 17, Numbers 13, 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, that's the promised land, he said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like. 
And whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many, what kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. Um, we don't, if you're like me, which you probably are, we're not a, a culture like FCCB or, or even America at large. We're not a culture that looks to uh, go into some sort of conquest mode, other than if we're gaming. If we're not gaming, we're not in that mode. But th- this is what Moses is doing. He's thinking, all right, God is given us a promised land, but there's still some work to be done. We've got to go fight to win this thing. And so this is his battle plan, very much like when you're searching for a used car, right? All right, go kick the tires, figure out, check the guy, is it worth it? Am I paying the right price? You're on a mission, you're scoping it out, you're researching. And Moses is wanting his guys to do all the research necessary so that the Israelites can come in and finally claim the promised land. So in verse 21, the Bible calls them spies. So they went up, these spies, and explored the land from the desert of Zin, as far as Rehob, toward Lebo, Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron, where Ahimon, Sashai, and Telmai, the descendants of Anak, Live. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. So when they reached the valley of Eskel, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. All right. Just mentally, when I go get a cluster of grapes, I put it in a snack bag, right? Like you do too, probably. Yet this cluster of grapes, you got two pretty hefty dudes who are like the exploring uh, rangers checking things out. They have to have a pole to carry the cluster of grapes. And so mentally you can just begin to picture, wow, that must be big. These grapes must be huge. Never mind the pomegranates that they also put on there. That place was called the Valley of Eskal. Because the cluster of grapes, the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. I want you to hear this report. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. And they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. And then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with them said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. So we get this report coming back from this promised land, Israel's future. And uh, both groups, it's Caleb and Joshua is with Caleb. You have two over here and ten over here. And they both see the exact same thing. And this is what's amazing to me. Two groups of people see the very same thing 
They're traveling together, and they both come to polar opposite conclusions. The group of ten says, there are some huge people there, and we're really afraid. We're, we're scared of them. They can beat us up. There's no way that we can go conquer the land. And Caleb and Joshua are over here, seeing the same giants, seeing the same people, seeing the same fearful-sized warriors, saying, of course we can. God is with us. God is with us. Of course we can go into the land. Let me uh, finish up our, our scripture, then share some thoughts. Chapter 14. That night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had gone back and died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. And then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and He will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Um, So, as... As you start a new year, as I start a new year, one of the the typical things that tends to happen is a couple, a family, an individual kind of collects their thoughts together, looks out over the year, and and sets some kind of plan. These are the big things coming. This is what we hope we might be able to do. These are some of the challenges coming our way. These are some of the financial obligations we have. We tend to to do a little self-check at the beginning of the new year. And when we do it, when we do it, there's two things we always see. We always see some possibility of some really good things. We see some giants that are standing in the way of those good things. The giants are fear. That's what they are. It's at least what, what these folks cause within the Israelite community Fear to the extent that the the people of God were able to say, oh no, Egypt is better than this. I can't imagine the fear that would grip me to say slavery is better than what you have for me, God. But that's the place that God's people were at. So I just wrote down a question. These are where some of the nonlinear stuff is coming in this morning. I just started... Writing down, what are some of the giants for FCCB? What are some of the the things in our future? What are some of the the scary uh, recognitions that we have right now? Um, You can probably add to this list. This is just what, what I'm perceiving from us. Here are some of the giants for FCCB as we look out into our future. Um. One of them is we, a a scale that's simply marking an average. It's not completely, in every case, true. But as a whole, we're getting older. Our church is getting older. How do I know that? Because I'm about to marry uh, four kids that are no longer kids this spring, summer, fall. Uh, to me, it's just a recognition that, well, these guys used to be little, and these guys used to be in high school, and these guys used to be in college, and oh, now they're getting married. And uh, it's awesome. It, I don't think I have a greater privilege, other than maybe baptism, of performing a wedding for someone that I've been able to love and know and pastor for many years. 
it's a great delight of my heart to be engaged. It's also indicative that a lot of years has gone by, right? And if you're one of those parents, you feel that probably a bit more intense than I do. It's just the reality. As years go by, we get older. We get older. Uh, in fact, I find myself, it, it just is, I find myself t- taking a, a, double, a double take when someone tells me their child's age now. Wait, what? When did, when did that happen? When did Gavin get so old? How did that happen? And as our church tends to be getting older, it becomes harder to gear up for work days or energy-consuming events, doesn't it? You feel that. It's just a reality. And so what that does in us is it drives something deeper in that ignites some fear. What does this mean? What does this mean for us? There's a second giant for us. Uh, Part of what I want to do this morning is just just put things out there that are on our minds that maybe we're not speaking. We're getting older. Number two, church competition. I don't know if um, everyone feels it or maybe from my position I feel it. There's a lot of pressure to be like others. There's a lot of pressure to have success that looks like others' success, other churches. In fact, I will hear every so often another church's success either minimized or criticized as a way to try to tamper it or held out as a model to attain that, hey, we should be like fill, fill in the gap. In fact, I've even heard the analogy that FCCB is like a small hardware store as the box stores around, all right? I don't know if that totally resonates with you, but it's one of the giants like, oh no, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Here's a, a third giant for FCCB. Many of you are facing... Super challenging times, especially in your marriage. Uh, You would describe 2016 as a pretty dark year. I've been involved in a lot of your stories, uh, praying with you, trying to counsel and walk through a lot. I'm sure I'm not privy to, but a 2016 was tough for a lot of you. And as you look out into 2017, you don't really see rosy skies Instead, you see this giant, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to my marriage? What's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen this year? In fact, uh, Nick Landry was sharing a book with me. I can't wait to read it. Uh, It was basically that sometimes nighttime darkness is a gift from the Lord for us. I can't wait to dive into that. I just want to let you know, if that's describing you, if you're in some of those dark days right now, your elders literally are praying for you. If we know about it, we're holding you up in prayer by name before the throne. Because night tends to create fear. One of my uh, most vivid nighttime memories um, years ago, Ethan and I backpacked up to uh, little shelter up uh, by West Bond, and it was Ethan's first overnight. Um, He was too young at the time to really carry a ton of stuff, and so I I had more than I would have had now. Got up there, set up camp, and I thought I was just going to, like, conk out, right? I I was wiped out. I was tired. And uh, I remember that night, it got cold. My body hurt. I couldn't fall asleep. I couldn't fall asleep. And by like 2, 3 in the morning, I'm in that anxious place that if you've had trouble sleeping, you know what that's like. You go to that anxious place where 
oh no, the night's almost done. And then you flip, your mind flips, right? And all of a sudden you're like, ah, just get me to the morning. And it's no longer about falling asleep. It's like, just, just be done with this night. Just bring me the morning. Because sometimes nighttime is a place that yearning for the morning happens the most. Some of you are in that place where the darkness, the struggle, the strife, the brokenness that's been all around you has flipped and it's created this massive yearning. God, give me the morning. God, would the sun just rise on the horizon here? The darkness can be a place of reflection and heart change too. And Here's our fourth giant. Seeking comfortable seeking comfortable when the giants and the challenges are in the land when fear is before you when your year looks like it might be challenging your default just like Israel's default is to shirk back to the zone all right so what is Israel's safe zone Egypt. Because it doesn't matter how good or how bad the safe zone is, it's familiar and it's safe. And when the giants start coming, you start thinking, I might as well go back to that bad habit. I might as well go back to that place where at least the giants weren't there. And in that place, it can be devastating, even though it's familiar. I think uh, the big problem for Israel is that they didn't even care if Egypt was not God's fullness that he has for his people. And here's one of our challenges, guys. I love you deeply. I would give my life for you. And I'm honest when I say my desire is to serve you in a way that would represent Jesus well, for as long as God would have. But it is not healthy to yearn for the former days. And those of us who have been around FCCB for any length of time, we can find ourselves drifting back when the challenges come, when it's not going to be easy, when things are going to be hard, we can find ourselves drifting back and saying, Oh, I remember when fill in the blank. We start yearning for a time that is not coming back. We start yearning for a time that is not God's desire for fullness for His people. It's almost like a yearning similar to Israel. Well, if I can just go back to Egypt. Remembering former days is natural, but it's not a destination. All right, there you go. There's uh, four giants that, that I see for FCCB. But here's the good news. There's giants in the land, but what else is in the land? Here's some really good fruit, and it's flowing with milk and honey. And so I want to share some thoughts about that too. Because I think God has... I don't like pomegranate, so this doesn't really work for me. Maybe really juicy strawberries are in the land. I could go for that. But the fruit of the promised land is so enticing that Caleb and Joshua say, we don't care who the enemies are. God is moving us. God is pushing us. God can do it. Let's go. Let's go get the milk. Let's go get the honey. Let's go get the figs. So what are some of the the milk and honey or the pomegranates and grapes that I see for FCCB? Here's the the first. I do think we're getting older. But I also think we're getting wiser. Do you know how many opportunities we have to mentor people? I mean, think of what you've heard, the testimony of LifeBridge, those who are involved in LifeBridge. Isn't that amazing? As we get older... One of the things that happens is we have more experiences. Some of us have transitioned to empty nests for the first time. And it is. And all of a sudden, opportunity to be able 
to mentor someone else that's coming up. Some of you just had babies for the first time. There's a lot of couples that are about to be married, and what a great opportunity to mentor. Some of you just retired. What a great opportunity to mentor someone who's heading towards her. The older we get, the more wisdom God has given us through experiences, the more opportunities we have to bless others and to mentor. It also means uh, we have an opportunity to be really generous. This is not true across the board, I get it. But generally, the older you get, the more money you make to a certain point. And then you retire, and then you skimp back down and try to save through retirement. But uh, on an overall scale, generally speaking, kids are out of the house. We no longer have kid expenses. For some of us, the house is paid for. We no longer have a mortgage. And our career goes to the point that there's a bigger income than when we were 23 and just out of college. And it just means, for many of us, we have an opportunity to be even more generous to what God is working. Getting older also means we have an opportunity to divest and put our own personal interests aside to allow the younger to step in. And I just want you to know, when I say we're getting older, I don't mean that like everyone. We, we have lots of, of young people here today, not just college students, but, but younger folks. But, but on, on an overall, like, what's the average age of FCCB, I, I think that's the number that has increased over the years. We have an incredible opportunity right now to take some of the things that, that we've been doing for a long time, that's been our responsibility, that God has equipped and gifted us to do, to say, Tell you what, would, would you be willing to give it a try? Oh, you have a new idea? That's awesome, let's try it. I wouldn't choose that, but hey, we can do it. We can let it go that way. We can let that thing come in. We can try that new thing together as we divest to those who are younger. And finally, I don't know if there's anything more important for us as a congregation, and for people to care about our marriages, to open homes, to mentor, to share, to share some counseling and testimonies and stories together. Getting older is not the trajectory typically that a group would choose, but there are pomegranates and figs out there for us that entails a great blessing from the Lord if we would only say, Yes, Lord! I'll choose to bless. I'll choose to give. I'll choose to hand off to others. All right, number two. Milk and honey. I think when it comes to church competition, let me say this. I don't have any, I can't have any more love or respect for the churches around us. Uh, I've gotten to know each of the pastors, each of the churches, uh, to a pretty deep level. And you never, ever hear me criticize other churches from the pulpit. Because I love them. I love them. I love Be Free, and I love Journey. I love Next Level. I love Grace. I love DEC. I pray for them often. I love them. And I love them because each of the churches in this area has this great kingdom role. See, this isn't an FCCB thing or a Journey or a DEC thing. This is a God-Christ thing that God is working out among us with His kingdom. And each of the churches in our area plays this awesome place within the kingdom to do and to be the church that God has equipped them to be. But we're not Be Free and we're not Journey and we're not Next Level and we're not Grace and we're not DEC. And here's some really good news. God is not asking us to be any of them. Isn't that awesome? 
Isn't that freeing to just say that? God is asking us to be the family that He's designed us to be. To be fully alive to our community in the way that He's designed us to be. And equipped us to be. And I think for one of those, one element of that, is that at FCCB, it's a general statement that people come before programs. People come before programs. And so we're not a highly programmatic church. I don't have an issue with that as long as people are a focus of us. We also always, since I've been here, have thrived and continue to thrive with multi-generations. We have folks living and moving and breathing among us who are 80, 90. And we have little babies in the nursery and everything in between. But it's not just that those ages are here. There's a value that FCCB has always placed on the intermingling in there. It's been a huge blessing for my family. It's been a huge blessing for my kids. It's been a blessing for our elderly population. It's been a blessing for the little guys running around. Another element of people not programs. I am so eager with the elders to once again make disciple-making our focus. We have too much pressure on Sunday mornings. All right? If Sunday morning bombs, it's like, oh no, what else is there? Right? For a lot of you, that's our life together. I see you Sunday, you see me Sunday, it's all good, as long as the worship goes well, as long as the preaching goes well, as long as things go smoothly, pretty good. But there's too much pressure on Sunday mornings right now for it to go well, to make sure it goes well. Because we've lacked the disciple-making behind it for some time now. There's a reason for that. Our elder team has been really skinny for a long time. and We've literally just been trying to hold on and desperately praying, God, hold us together, and God, give us strength, and God, just let us, let us be for a while. We are now at the point, uh, just, was it last Monday, or we just shifted time, so I forget exactly when we met, but recently, your elder team literally just took a turn to say, all right, we've been together now for a couple months, beginning to open up our lives. We're turning now to say, how do we be good shepherds for the church? Jesus, where are you leading us? Jesus, give us a word. Let us go so that we can lead our people behind us. And I'm so excited to journey that with our elders. In fact, some of you, some of you, have never been at FCCB experiencing good, healthy, strong leadership from your elder team. And it's striking to say that. But some of you have never known that because you came in a year ago, two years ago, and you've kind of stuck into the Sunday morning, maybe, maybe a few little things on the side. I am faithfully confident that 2017 is going to be a really good year for you. Where your shepherds will finally be free to serve as shepherds. All right. Here we go. Oh, by the way, um, I want to say, just a, speaking of people over programs, um, a big thank you. My wife is in the nursery today, uh, but I know she would verbalize this. We got a glimpse of a taste of heaven Friday night. And I'm not even saying that as a cliche. I'm saying that as people over programs. Um, A group of people showed up at our house with uh, ukuleles and like uh, tambourines and shakers. And they did what in Puerto Rico is called a paranda, uh, which is this wild party that goes deep into the night and you go house to house to house and you end with this big feast. And a group of people showed up at our house, snuck up behind my wife because when she's in front of the fireplace, that's like her zone and nothing else is really around. 
um, probably 20 people snuck up behind her and started banging on the tambourines and singing some Spanish songs, and she lit up. We all lit up. And uh, I don't know, how long did we go? Like 12.30, 1 o'clock, we were like going, going to bed. It, it was just this crazy, cool, fun scene. It wasn't a program. It was just people loving each other, and we caught a glimpse of that this weekend. Number three, the name of that book that I mentioned that uh, Nick was talking about is Learning to Walk in the Dark. One of the things that I value about our times together, guys, is that we don't rah-rah. We don't stand up and simply like celebrate, hey, everyone's happy and we're all good and all right, here we are. Because life isn't like that. So sometimes we'll open up a psalm together that's like, God, where are you and why have you forsaken me? I don't understand. And sometimes our lives are lived in those dark days. And so we get to not just celebrate the sunny days, but God is present in the darkness too. And so we open up that together. Ask some of the big questions together. And sometimes the struggle that we have The testimony, oftentimes, is that it's the greatest place of meeting mercy and grace. And I know that God loves me, not because I'm good, but because Jesus is good, because I'm a mess. And I'm so glad God is loving me right at this moment. Sometimes it's at our struggle that mercy and grace are the clearest. I think this is also going to be a year that our worship service gets restructured to help God's story penetrate all of life where it's not just happy songs, but bringing our tough days in as well. So here's a mental picture for you. God's faithfulness is not only seen at an empty tomb. I mean, that an empty tomb, that's a big like, yeah, we, we celebrate that a lot, often, I'm in. But God's faithfulness and His presence is not only found at an empty tomb. His faithfulness and His presence is found in the darkness of the belly of a whale. With seaweed wrapped around someone's head where Jonah prays out, and then I remembered your faithfulness. See, whatever day you're in, God is faithful to you. And he will meet you. And there's a glory that can happen even in the darkness that sometimes can't happen in the light. Here's our our final pomegranate and fig. I can't wait to fail in order to succeed this year. I can't wait to share the freedom for you to fail in order to succeed. Meaning, if we don't try new things, we're going back to Egypt. Right? And we only try new things if we have some confidence that, okay, no matter how this goes, uh, Jesus, you still love me and I'm still valuable to you. So, whoop, out we go. And sometimes that'll be a stumble and a miserable wreck and the program just bombed and no one showed up and it wasn't cool. And so we'll pick ourselves back up and say, well, what if we tried this? And hey, that's awesome, that works, and that's meeting me, and it's speaking to my heart. We're not going to find ourselves drifting to the known, but trusting to our unknown. I think for the same reason that Israel was called by Caleb and Joshua. The reason is because the Lord is with us. I think this is going to be the year that we take a step from praying over the addiction crisis to moving in to the addiction crisis. Will we fail? I don't know. We might. We might not help a single soul out there. Or it may be one of the glorious moments for FCCB to help someone struggling to live life in its fullness, to meet a God of grace, to know Jesus and freedom, maybe for the first time in years. I don't know how that's going to go. But it means our ministries will be taking risks. Some will thrive. Others collapse as we move forward. 
But part of growing is attempting and stepping out. And on a personal note, freedom to fail in order to succeed. Pastorally, some of you are holding on to grudges and unforgiveness and bitterness for far too long, and it's destroying you. I'm praying that on a personal level, as you see that giant, you'll be willing to fail in order to succeed, to offer forgiveness, and it might not be accepted, to seek reconciliation, and it might not be returned, but that your heart would be freed That the good Lord above who says He will not forgive if we withhold forgiveness. That we would step forward in 2017 would be a brand new year where I say, it's enough. I'm releasing. I'm forgiving. No matter what kind of return comes back. Corporately, I think uh, Hebron House is going to be a big conversation this year. Our facilities, our staff. Programs to line up with a clarified mission. How do we best make disciples at FCCB? I can't wait for that conversation. It's been a long time coming. A um, good friend of mine, years ago, um, gave me this phrase that, that I've held on to. He said uh, something to the effect of, it's time to leave the manna behind. <clears throat> manna was God's provision for his people in the desert. Just like flakes of, like, I, you'd get by and... It was sustaining, and thank you, God, for the manna. That's great. But uh, he was just giving me counsel. It's time to leave the manna behind because there's milk and honey in the promised land. I'm looking to leave some manna behind, guys, this year. This year, as God restores and God renews and God grows and God moves into a new land, I don't think Israel would ever have had its full life in the desert or in Egypt. It had to be in the promised land. But to get to the flowing milk and honey, they they would have to face a giant. The only question was, would they have faith that God would come through for them? Ten of them said, nope, they're too big for God. Therefore, they're too big for us. And two of them said, yes, we can. Let's go, let's go, let's go. FCCB will never have its full life in the comfort of the past or in mimicking other churches, but rather confidently striding forward in our identity in Christ. Thankful for who God made us to be. Thankful for where God is leading us. And I can't wait to be a part of the adventure with you. Because the Lord is with us. We should go. We should go. Let me pray and uh, invite our worship team back up as I pray here. God, I can't help but think that sometimes the giants in the land, the fears in our future, the challenges in our plans... Well, I can't help but think that sometimes they're there for the sole reason that we would have to have faith in you. That we can't do it on our own. And Lord, if that's your desire, I pray you'd bring them on. That you would bring on the challenges, that you would bring on the fear, that you would bring on the giants in order to push your people to trust you. That you could do things through us that we could never do on our own. God, we ask for your spirit to breathe that kind of courage into us this year. Lord, sovereignly, would you guide us into the adventures for your glory into the community this year. God, we seek your blessing, not that our name would be great, but that your name would be great. God, I pray that for all of our sister churches. I pray that your hand would be on, be free this year as they venture out and journey. God, may 
Barrington experience blessing beyond imagination from our three churches. God, I pray this for the folks up in Rochester as they deal more intensely with some of the, the issues of addiction and poverty. God, may your hand be on grace and the commons. God, thank you for placing us in a time and in a county that has churches who love you. God, we pray that you would instill courage in our hearts to do the things that you've called us to do, that we may go forward with a a war cry of, yes, we can. Amen.